we're two albums deep now. I want to mention that um, as a group, Sky, according to my research, uh, charted seven top 40 R&B albums. And from those, 15 top 40 R&B hits between 1979 and 1992. Quite an impressive run. Congratulations to you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, somebody compiled that. Right, that's, that's so nice. <laughs> okay. uh, so, oh, I, uh, an observation on that second record too. I think is that track "Dance." You know, I mean, there's some funny stuff in there, and I think it really shows. I think with those kind of lyrics and with the kazoo's, you guys had a good sense of humor too, and you had fun and didn't take it too seriously. You know, we yeah. always had fun. You know what I'm saying? We, it's uh, uh, our, our. Uh, personalities gelled so much to the point that we were family. We still are family. And so we were able to have fun, even though we were working and always worked very hard, we still were able to have fun. And I do believe that that translated a lot into our music as well. And there was always one song on each album that was we like, called the the, we called it the Frankenstein song, but it was, <laughs> it was the fun song that we said, okay, we're doing all this other serious stuff. Let's do something where we can just have to do Right. And Dance Dance was, was for that album, it was the fun one. Right. Charles is going to go find some. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, I had a question involving him. I'll move to something else for now. Oh, right. right. So, hey, he's back. Um, on those first two records, especially, uh, it seems like musically they were very much sort of like a two-man band. Is that kind of like a correct assessment, or who who was doing what musically uh, on those first two records? So I'll, yes. I'll, 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 I'll drop. Our drummer, Tommy McConnell, was playing drums on everything. Our bass player, Joe LeBone, was playing bass on everything. Our lead guitar, lead and rhythm guitar, uh, Butch Sierra was playing lead and rhythm guitar. Me, I was playing rhythm guitar. And keyboards was all Randy Mullen. Uh, and, you know, in the second, first two albums, Randy Mullen. Right. right. OK. So. How did your guys' lives change, you know, once you started getting this uh, popularity and success? You know, uh, did you become celebrities in your old neighborhoods? And, you know, <laughs> how, how did you adapt to this new, uh, this new life? Well, you know, I think the, the thing we had to adapt to most was balancing our day jobs at with, point. yeah, at that point, balancing our day jobs with, going out on the road. That was, I think, the trickiest part of it. Fortunately for us, as far as family was concerned, it wasn't as much to balance, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, uh, but, and were we celebrities? I think, well, I we second, were- I found a second album, I don't think there were the day jobs. There were no day jobs, <laughs> the second one. There were no day jobs there. I had a second, I had a day job. What are you talking about? When we went out on the road, second, honey, we didn't have- a second album? We was working temp. We were working temp, we were working temp but we <laughs> that's a day job. I don't care what <laughs> what you mean. But what we're saying is there was no full time nine to five job. Right, right. That's well, what I'm trying to say. Well, that's what I'm saying. But but well, we can be able to have a temp opportunity. That's right. Temp you know, jobs so in order to maintain the rent. There's this thing called the rent that has to be, you know, maintained. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> but so, then, but I, but as far as like celebrity was concerned, we were very much a neighborhood yeah. group of people. See, we yeah. rehearsed in Salomon's basement. Everyone knew us before, and, yeah, and, they, knew, and they knew us after. That's and, right. And uh, we were just maybe folks. maybe a little more popular. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. but right. you know, we were just still with the people from the neighborhood. Right. Uh, my father always uh, jokingly complained that my father, who is actually a, a Baptist minister, he had a church, and uh, he, he'd always complain that that if I showed up in the church, they weren't really interested. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and they just want to see somebody from Sky. Uh, but other than that, I mean, uh, we were pretty much down to earth, and yeah, yeah. We, we knew yeah. we were never as good or as bad as people thought that we were. So. Right. I, I think what 
I think what really happened was sometimes was after we started doing a lot of the TV shows. When we started doing a lot of the TV shows, is when people would really start to recognize. So we started with Soul Train, Solid Gold, American Bandstand. Then as you would go places, people, you would see people look at you, and then you would see the whispering, and you yeah. would know that <laughs> you've been recognized. You've been recognized. Yeah. You know what well, saying? when you're wearing the space outfits around, that's why. <laughs> yeah, that would have worked. That would do it. If yeah. you step, you step off the tour bus, and, yes. you, and you're going to McDonald's, that's and, right. and and you're this group of people who don't look like from, from around right. here, <laughs> you get the look. And then not only you don't look from around here, you look like I should know who you are. Oh. You're like, you're familiar. Because they look. Yeah, because right. this is, you, you, are you going to be at the show that they have been down at the Coliseum tonight? <laughs> right. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we didn't have that super recognition factor, you know what I mean? Because we, we didn't we walk just look like regular people. We, right. Yeah, and that's the other thing. We, did, we didn't have an entourage. We didn't have security. See, I think a lot of groups uh, draw attention to themselves because right. they have so much going on around So we have something to show you. More. Not more. More. There it is. The infamous. Wait. Right. Okay. Which way? You got to hold it the right way so you can see it. Can you see it? Just a little closer. Oh, yeah. you're too high. There it is. Okay. Yeah. That's you. <laughs> Yay! The new here is that. They work. Now we have to say Aileen at Boston. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. So running down in that basement. Oh, it takes a team. It takes That's a team awesome. to make this better. <laughs> awesome. So I, I wanted to uh, suggest also, you know, my observation was that the first two records very much had like sort of the brass construction -y kind of stamp, you know, it was, to me, I felt like the group started to really establish its own identity the most from the third record on, you know, I mean, although the first two were unique in their own ways, I think they were close, more closely tied to the brass sound, if that makes sense. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, when you have Randy Muller writing, uh, <laughs> pretty much. Well, no, it was him and so, yeah. him and so. See, and it's it, it's interesting that you brought out some of the more fun songs because the more fun songs really were mostly written by you. Would you say, Solomon? It was fun. Well, yeah, I'm yeah. saying you yeah. know the the more yeah. Yeah. quirky, kooky, fun songs. Yeah. You wrote Sky Zoo. Yes. Right. So you know, and then Randy was a little bit more of the sort of serious stuff. But I think by the third album. The sky, started to come in more what, what really would define sky, mm -hmm. define us as sky, started to be uh, developed a little bit more, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he realized that we weren't brass, and he, and, he, <laughs> and, and he was writing, you know, he was really writing for the girls the way they sound and, and, and the guys the way we play. Right. right. Yeah. And, of course, I yeah. just wrote that way. <laughs> and <laughs> all along. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so I think uh, in that way, that third record was part of the progression to where you really sort of, you you will kind of peaked at least commercially with the fourth one. But um, that third one though, before I go on to the the big the biggest one, uh, you had Here's to You, yep. I Can't Get Enough, Super Love, again, just killing it from the start of the record. Um, what was different creatively and in that whole process with that? And again, the outfits were toning down a little bit more uh what was happening at that time i think there was certainly a maturation we were becoming more mature sure. and more uh uh clear about us as sky mm -hmm. uh uh more defined right and yes. what our sound was here's to you one of the greatest songs that we've ever yeah. done i mean really and people, i think people love that song i think too we started to work with other artists that were firmly established. And so then you start to see we're on the road, you know, then you really start to see what it is. I mean, a lot of people look and say, oh, you go on stage, you sing, and that's it. We really started to see what it was, the traveling, the going from city to city, the performance, the radio stations. Right. 
the promo, you know, did we all of this stuff started to come into play. And then we started to realize this is what really being an artist is really all about. And so we did start to mature in that way in in the music business. Uh, and and sound wise, again, Randy and myself were were, you know, maturing and 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 sort of Evolving into uh, to, to diff experiment in different areas, and uh, we we never wanted to, to to try to do the carbon copy of that was successful. There, let's do another one like that, but just a little bit different. We wanted to try something well, uh, something that was a little bit different altogether, and still knowing that it was important to keep the funk. And what we were doing, keep the dance ability and what we were doing, and keep in mind being able to perform at, uh, songs. Uh, because I, I, I just personally don't like radio songs that are just, okay, it'll play on the radio, it's good, but you go to, to, to play in a concert and, and it does nothing for people. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't move them, it doesn't do anything. Well, we want to have songs that, that we can perform live and, and, and make, make people feel it. And, and we, we like to entertain. Yes. That's yes. what it was. We didn't, as like Saul said, we didn't just want you to listen to us on the radio and then go to see us and, and be disappointed. <laughs> and say, oh, I could have listened to that on the radio. We've they always, always made, they always did songs that we could be entertained that were good, vocally, musically, and we could also entertain. I've always been a, a very firm believer in if I go to see you, I need to see something that I can't hear on the radio. I, I want what I see to give me the same feeling that I hear when I hear this music. And because um, we were, I mean, from us performing at people's weddings and this and that when we were growing up, it's always a matter of let me be visual. I need to see something that's going to excite me. And because my sisters and I were always firm believers in, in doing choreography and, and watching how the Temptations did things and how we were visually entertained, we needed to be able to give that to the audience, the same thing that we would want for our own selves. So we always made sure that we had like, the biggest production that we could, could do at that moment in time. We had a great lighting guy who was like on point. Davidson Graham was extremely amazing, team. especially when it came to the color, the, the color foils that he used to use. And, and that's one of the reasons why wearing white for us was so much easier than doing a color because David could bring those colors out and all the sparkle and the whole nine. So we wanted to be visually entertaining to everybody so that they walked away from the, from the Sky Show feeling like, wow, I'm tired because I was so excited and I can't talk because I've been screaming. And that's, that's I think we accomplished that. And Solomon, were you, were you the one that mostly re rehearsed them, or how were, how was the band rehearsed for those shows? They were rehearsed and then rehearsed, <laughs> and, and, then, and then complained about rehearsing. That's and right. Then, and they complained and then, about more And then say, "Do it like you would do it on stage." Oh my and goodness, goodness. we had a many and, many. and and then when they got on stage, it was like automatic. It just yeah. It was fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you know what? It was a good thing. This is what the good thing was. The band usually rehearsed sometimes by themselves. And then the three of us would rehearse by ourselves because we were doing the steps. Now, and I was well, singing, but months. we're it's doing the choreography months. too. So they would rehearse, and then we would rehearse, and then we would rehearse together. And then they would rehearse away. So that is how we were able to really um, gel our, our show um, as much as we did because we did have the opportunity to step back and rehearse by ourselves because in order to put on a show it had to be cohesive and so but when we would get us in that basement we'd be like oh oh, oh my goodness <laughs> not the basement again <laughs> the basement. The basement that was the hub i mean and we would you know Speaking of the basement and, and going back to the whole thing about the neighborhood. So we would have an audience yes. built oh. in from the kids in the neighborhood, right, right Solomon? Right. They, we left the, but first of all, we left the doors you open because it was hot. hot. <laughs> right. yeah. and, if it, and if you heard the music, you came in, you were quiet, you sit on the steps, you That's sit right. on the door, and you just watch what went on. And uh, 
a lot of the young kids in the neighborhood grew up watching us rehearse. That's right. And and it wasn't the point that we tried to rehearse to the point where where there was no spontaneity, but right. just rehearse where there was a certain proficiency. Right. Because when you hit the stage, all things go wrong. Murphy's Law is always there. Yeah. That's right. And and no matter what part of Murphy's Law was happening on the night when we were on the stage, we had a solution for it. We knew how to how to make it work That's and how to make it feel right. right. So that you know we were we were prepared for it. So it was just Rehearsing to be prepared for whatever might uh, come, what come. will eventually happen right. that wasn't happening in the basement. That's right. And wow. and a lot of that could have been just as simple as because back then we used to have microphones with cords. Cords. And that was the biggest and danger. And the three legged, <laughs> the three legged that was, that was And the three legged stands, right? That was the biggest hazard for for us in, in particular. That's right. Um, and not to mention swinging guitar necks. Guitar. There was that yeah. too. That's right. Uh, you know, bodies just in motion, you know, on the stage. So I can really appreciate what you're saying in yeah. terms of rehearsal sort of made everything so automatic yeah. that no matter what was going wrong, it, it, in spite of that cord wrapped around your foot, but, you, you know, know, you knew how to get it from off of your foot and pick up the routine where it belonged. Where, you know, it was like it was like it was Yes, 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 exactly. All, all the accidents were planned. Yes. <laughs> and, there, and, and, and there were many. <laughs> but, yeah, were, but I well, think the basement lended to us being able to perform on any side stage. Yeah, because we performed tight. on large stage stages and we performed on small stages. And I think being able to rehearse in that basement, it helped us to be able to perform on we could perform on this table. <laughs> I, I think you're going a little too far. <laughs> <laughs> we have, but I'm just saying, we have, that's right. Well, we but yes, we had some tight, tight some space. tight spaces in in, in clubs well, and, and, right. and and some large spaces in in arenas. Well, that's right. And, and that when we get all that room, we just don't know what to do. Well, so we just go running. That's one right. One to the Well, it begs a question, of course. What was the most uh, unforgettable experience out there performing live, whether it was something that was uh, an accident or something that was uh, funny or especially memorable, there's gotta be that one or two things that just happened. It'll be different for everybody. Yeah. But I have mine. It's, it's okay. All right, let's see what I do. Okay, mine is is the Cap Center in, in DC. Um, we, our equipment truck broke down, so our equipment didn't arrive. Our, our we played New York the night before. Uniforms were left, so we didn't have our we didn't have our, our costumes that we normally would play. So, but we we had what we travel with, which is basically our guitars, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and it and and our and our group jackets. Yeah, so right. so we 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 wore that and we borrowed them from mm -hmm. uh, Rick James and and Ray Parker Jr. and and we performed at, and and. Uh, each region has their own popular song. And, you know, Call Me was out at the time. So we, we figured, you know, that's the big song. When we play that, yeah, the house is going to go crazy. We played a song called Let's Get Up in DC. Mm -hmm. And that happened to be the song yeah. that every, and at that point, we were on stage. They had these big jumbotron uh, screens. And we hadn't played the place with the jumbotron screens that we could actually see them. And we got preoccupied. <laughs> we were watching, watching ourselves on the screen, and the audience was performing the songs. Oh, we were just right. playing. <laughs> we, they just sung the whole song, and we played yeah, and watched out and have a good time. You see that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was memorable to me. And right. to this day, I haven't forgotten that. Wow. Same one for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Same one for I think my favorite one. Is we were this. This is during the time that we were on a cool and gang tour, and then sometimes we would be off that tour and we'd be somewhere else. And I remember having we had the privilege of doing this a show with Stevie Wonder. That was Dallas. Oh, that was Texas. Yeah. That was yeah. Dallas. Yeah. Dallas, yeah. Texas. Yeah. Stevie Wonder from, 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 from Aretha Franklin, yeah. from, from, from uh, the Luther Vandross. Wow. Yeah. I was on that show, so you should go. Oh, I stayed up for Stevie Pete, Wonder. That's all I know. That's all I care about. I think it was Pebo Bryson. It was just the major. Quincy Jones. Right. Quincy Ingram. Jones. Uh, and Luther Ingram. Patty Austin. Austin. Patty Austin. Yeah, that was the bomb. Wow. Sounds like we are the world. 
Yeah, it was, everybody. And we everybody. were just, just and we we were starstruck. So, yeah, we were so tired. We just left we Disney. We just, just left California. We had just right. left Disney. Right. And we, I mean, we were gigging. And we were doing right. two and three shows a day. I mean, we were so tired. But we refused to leave that arena until we heard Steve we one time. <laughs> and when I it was the best show because he had the entire arena singing in harmony. Yeah. And I will never forget yeah, that as long as I live. What, what year was that? Do you remember? What, that what, was in California. 19, what, what? It had to oh, what be. year? You said what year? year? Okay. It was 82. It was 82, 82, 82, or 82 because it was 82 because when 82, we came 82. home, Mommy and we had we had to come home and do the Swiss Malt Like a Beer commercial. Right. Mommy and Daddy had already left to move to South Carolina. Oh, okay. My daughter was a couple months old because we had done we had done uh, Disneyland when we left. She, it, we did Disneyland for six weeks. Right. And we came back home. It was like May June. Right. That was right. that was that was nineteen eighty two. I'll never forget that. Yeah. I will never forget that as always. Yeah. That was I, uh, I saw Stevie Wonder. It got it had to be eighty one at the Forum in Los Angeles, a hundred than July tour. And so, it was, right, right. It was incredible. It was all during that time. Yeah, yes. Yeah. What was yours? No, I was going to say, actually, I was going to say the Disney was the most memorable because it was the most grueling yeah. of the tours that I think you've ever done. Which Disney? Was Disney? Yeah. Brad Knight's Disney. Oh, Brad, I say. Florida Disney. Florida. That was Florida? Okay. okay. I, I can't remember. All I know was Disney, Disney, Disney. <laughs> Did I mention Disney? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we did. Oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, and that probably was, I think, the most grueling yeah, of all yeah. the tours that we've ever had because we were doing three shows a night, three shows, eleven, two, ten, two, eleven, two, and four in the four morning. morning. Okay, uh, we were already uh, uh, we did on New York. Our bodies were on one time, and and so the shows were all that you know right. California time, West Coast time. And they were booking shows right. in, in between. between those shows. So we went, I'll never forget, we went to go and do that <laughs> show in Concord, California. And then they tried to get us on that They tried to get us on a prop plane <laughs> to fly us back for the we Disney show. <laughs> Me and my sisters, let's show them how we were. We were like this. And so I was looking, we're getting on to <laughs> talking about we had to get on this prop plane. Mm -hmm. And we were scared to death. And the thing that stopped us from getting on the prop plane was they couldn't fit the guitars yes. in the wing space. And that was like the Lord directing that, that we right. should get back in the van. And if you remember the guy who drove us there, the guy who drove us there for some strange reason in that van, he waited. Remember, he waited. Yes. And we wound up leaving that little yeah. airport to go, to go back, back to, to the, the commercial, commercial airport, airport to fly, right. to, to fly on a regular sense, commercial yes, flight we back to Thank California. You. Now, we missed the first Disney show after all of this nonsense, but, yeah. but we were safe. I think I really feel that, that was yeah. we were just not supposed to get on those properties. Yeah. So that was my, you know, that was one of the best. <laughs> well, thank heavens that worked out like it did. Yes, yes. yes. here we are. <laughs> um, you know, I just want to take a moment to verify, um, are, is the device you're using plugged in to an AC outlet? It's not a battery? Yes, it is. You Excellent. Give, give to, yes. 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 Okay, good. Don't want to have to worry about a battery. Okay. Um, so let's um, move on to the, the, the huge hit that really uh, made Sky uh, to another level. You know, and I think ensured a really lasting legacy of, of the group beyond what it had already done, and that was the Skyline record in '81 uh, and "Call Me" and number one smash. You know, so talk to me about that experience. And did you sense? I mean, did you know right away that "Call Me" has got to be a hit? I don't know no. if we knew that. I, I, you know, we never, I don't think we there, thought that. And there was talk with us. So we released that as the first single. Mm -hmm. So we released Let's Celebrate right. or something like that. But I think they had gotten some sort of early uh, response from uh, uh, playing playing in clubs or something. And they said, you know, this, 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 is, the this is the song. And again, once it once it hit, it, it was fire. It New hit. York. Yeah. New York. Just like they say, you know, you 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 work your whole life to be an overnight success. It yes. Just, it, yes. It changed. Yeah. It changed. It it really we, changed us 
and and the working load because we worked so much <laughs> off of that album that it was unbelievable and we were touring we would come home and the train fare would have changed that's <laughs> how we worked the weather would be different you know what i'm saying it's winter we come back in summer you know it's, it was like it was uh, it was a humbling i say experience for all of us as far as the work and how quickly, like Saul said, you don't think that things are going to happen like that. You know, we, we were gradually doing our thing, but for that to hit and that album to be so large and that single to be so large, it was unbelievable. I'm scared. It was one of the enjoyable tours. Yes, yeah, it was. Because we, we were touring with Cool and the Gang, yeah. which were just such great people, and we and they, they had their their records was hot at the time yes. so with both groups being very popular it you know crowds were you know they, they were large they were into the music mm -hmm. it, it's like you know a dream of what you experience would think uh, the music business would be you're working with good people right. you got yes. tours and you're getting paid yeah so, <laughs> so <laughs> right. those, and you're selling three, out i mean we were those, set, we those three combinations out. were good yes yeah. so do you you know a lot of the uh guy groups they go out they hit that kind of success they run out and get sports cars and do that kind of stuff yeah. what did you guys do with success well you know what we we had good sense with that's <laughs> what i would say you're probably one of the few groups that actually didn't uh, uh squander and pay and just you know go out right, these big expenses. And, we and, wisely um formed a corporation and we had our funds go into the corporation and we paid salaries to everybody such insurance. that we were able, yeah, we had we had insurance, insurance. and we had our taxes paid. Thank That's you very right. much. And, um, you know, we right. paid, laughing. yeah, because nobody does that. People <laughs> just start <laughs> passing out the money and keeping it moving. But, smart. No, we uh, to make it last through the lean times. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, Absolutely. you know, That's so right. that, you know, you just don't squirrel, squander it all away. Yeah, exactly. Trying to live hard. We were living. In within our means and being practical about how we were going to move forward to the next and to the next and to the next. And I think people, a lot of people don't realize um, that, that, and for us, we were able to, for the first time, actually maintain our, our livelihoods, our rent and our, you know, the things that you need to live by our music. You know what I'm saying? Up until that point, it was half and half. So as I, as we stated before, you know, um, I worked temp as a secretary, legal secretary. We all worked temp. We all worked temp. So when we would come off the road, then we would get our temp jobs. We would work our temp jobs. And then, we oh, we got a three-week tour, four-week tour. Back on the back road, on. we would went. But this year, that, that year was the first time that we were actually Just able to it. maintain it our lives um, strictly with um, and then our music, uh, as well. in, music business right. income. And for some time so afterwards. For some yeah. time afterwards, you know, we just... But we, I think that came, too, from... Our upbringing. We none of us were brought up to have our heads in the cloud. So I think we come from humble beginnings. Our families were humble, you know, humble people. So that I think that was what lent us to be the people that we were then and the people we are now because we didn't look at ourselves as being. High flutant superstars. Right, superstars. <laughs> we just looked at it. I said, "Yeah, we were musical stars, right. but we weren't it was above anybody else." Right. It was a job and an adventure, and we loved it. So right, a job we, and an adventure. I right, like and we too. loved what we were doing. I just want to say it's so refreshing to hear that you had the business side. Not only were you grounded, but you had the business side of it together. It sounds like, and more often than not, you know, that's not the happy story. So, no. no. Yeah. That's fantastic. Two words, uh, music and business. Yes, sir. And we, we made sure that we, we learned both of them. So one of the uh, things that really made Sky's music special was the arrangements, and I don't think we really touched on, on that. So I wanted to uh, just ask about that, uh, both um, instrumentally and vocally. Where did Randy and your uh, Solomon roles in that um you know overlap or or how did that work 
Well, it, Randy arranged his, I arranged mine, and we both sort of gave input on each other's if we heard something. If I heard something on his song, I'd say, look, this would be nice over here. If he heard something on my song, he'd say the same. But we both ar arranged uh, our own uh, songs. And the vocal part of it, how much direction did you get from either Randy or Solomon in terms of, you know, how you would do the harmonies or, you know, what you would hit hard here, or go soft there and all that kind of thing? Well, I think in, in for the first several albums, you know, we took a lot of direction right. from them. We didn't have a, a lot of necessarily creative input, but um, I want to say on the latter albums, I think, well, that's because part of it was they'd always surprise us in the studio with what the songs were. Right. You know, we, we, yeah, we, we might do a demo here or there for various songs so they could get keys and see how we sounded right. on doing something. But for the most part, we'd come in the studio, this is the song, oh, we learned it, we sang it, they told us which notes to sing. Um, the interesting part was sometimes we would switch, switch notes, notes so that she would get a, yeah. you know, we sort of, sort of saw the artistry in me singing a higher note, Dolores singing right. a lower note. Right. Oh, um, yeah. And then they had this thing we used to call cluster mint, right. which I don't know what you call oh, that. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> music. Yeah. It, right. it must be a real it's word for, uh, for that, but it's where we just had so many harmonies layered oh, on top of each other. And it's found in a lot of our, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot yeah. of those, I, yeah. 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 If you listen to any of us, when we have this big, you know, sort of uh, harmonizing uh -huh. thing going on, um, so I, I want to say in the beginning, not so much, but I think for the end, the last several albums that we did, when we started to get the the um, uh, the um, hang songs, of it. yeah, the hang of it <laughs> uh, in advance, and I, especially I know for myself, I was able to I think put a little bit more into uh, uh, the ad libs and you know some of the some of the more stylization. Of uh, of the songs toward the toward the last three albums, I want to say. Because sometimes they would give us the words just on a piece of paper when we would come into the studio, and we listen to it a couple of times, and then we'd have to go in, and then they would give us direction from that booth. And then oh, I'm sorry. But okay. sometimes it, 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 they're referring to Randy Muller. Now yeah, that's true. <laughs> We know we've been down in the basement. <laughs> yes. We've sung the demo. Right. Okay. We, you know, and a lot of times I said, give me harmony on this. And, and then, you know, oh, they, they work it out. And then I, I say, okay, I want a little more of that on the. But right. yeah, we, we got to the point where I could say, okay, this is going to be harmony. Give it to me. Right, <laughs> and, 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 and then they, they I gotta they, give them that. They give yeah, it to yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just remembered the more tortured parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> Times when we would have the lyrics, and then if they wanted something up, we put we, we yeah, had our we, own little we, notes. We had our own little poof for you. Yeah, we had our little notes that we used to put. Okay, we need to go up here, and then we draw an arrow, and then we do a little circle over here. So, and only we knew what those things yeah, meant. It was, it was a shorthand. Yeah, 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 yeah. shorthand. So, you know, that's how we kind of worked it all out. Did you do much overdubbing on the vocals, or we we do we we would uh, we would uh, we would layer. Uh, you know, sometimes some, some of the backgrounds we wanted to just sound a little fuller, or uh, we would um, you want to emphasize a particular line, we would double that. You know, certain things were, uh, certain leads would, would, would be uh, just one track, and then you might come back and then yeah, and, and then layer a word or two, or or some that we just wanted a thicker sound, we might might double it. So it it, it varied on the song. Uh, you know, a lot, yeah, of course, the ballads are just, it is what it is, wow. <laughs> you know, but, but on some of the funk things that, that you try to get a certain effect or something, you might do a layer. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, the groove, <clears throat> excuse me, the groove in particular on Call Me, I mean, that rhythm, that groove is so, so tight, you know, how did you get it so tight? <laughs> well, again, we we were a, a funk band that that that's used to playing t together. So, uh, you know, if I had an idea or Randy had an idea, he'd come down. Okay, say, uh, play this. You know, play this. Play, play this bass line. Uh, give me, give me a little guitar. I said, you know, give me a little lap. You know, <laughs> and right. and then and then we start to you know groove it out and feel it out and. And feel where we kind of fit in the pocket until we're, okay, that's it. Okay, we got a song. 
and then we then he start working on the change. So we'll first get the feel, the groove, and if there was changes or or you know a break here, a riff there, you know we throw that in. But you know we had to start, start with the foundation of getting the the feel and the groove of the song, and you know that that there were songs that that was just a groove track that played all the way through and then went back and wrote lyrics for it yeah. <laughs> because of yeah. course the groove was so good. Mm -hmm. And that, that song must have been, I'm guessing, fun to sing too because, you know, it was really kind of provocative and... and uh... I want to say it became fun uh, <laughs> in performance, but I can remember the first opening line, sitting here, couldn't help hear you talking to your best friend. I must have done it a hundred times. Before, <laughs> <You're not satisfied. laughs> Before Randy was satisfied. Um, and, uh, you know, it taught me a lot about myself. I think I, <laughs> I learned about my patience and my ability to sing something. Uh, I thought I was singing it the same way, but apparently I was not singing it the same way all 122 mm -hmm. times. Right. But it was that song, they took their time with making sure that thing was just That's right. so right. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, right down to the call me's and uh, all of that. Um, and again, back when, Every single background yeah. is sung so, originally. That's right. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's not like we did a set and then they said, oh, we're going to put this, drop it wherever it needs to be dropped. Yeah. Every single one is sung originally. Not just that, but so many of the cuts for Sky were four or five minutes, you know, so they were long <laughs> too. So, I mean, yeah. you have to yeah. get it right for a long song. Yes, That's right. exactly. That's exactly right. That's yeah. right. And that record was pretty varied too. I mean, you had your kazoo jam again with Jam in the Box or Jam the Box, and uh, you had a reggae in there. Um, you want to get it on? That was Gerald, right? Me and yeah. Gerald. You and Gerald, yeah. Gerald. Solomon and our bass player Gerald wrote that. Yeah. That was fun too. And then you, I mentioned you're doing the Cool in the Gang tour. That's uh, kind of interesting because they had the big celebration and you had Let's Celebrate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I think that's why we, in addition to the fact that they were just the nicest, most even-tempered gentlemen that we could have ever, you know, got paired with, but our music, yes, complemented each other. And, you know, there's a lot of things going on when you go out on tour with a lot of groups and some people's egos are so big oh, yeah. that it makes it difficult if you're the quote-unquote opening act you know, you may not get the respect that you really deserve. And and we were always the type that if you're not going to respect us when we get out on that stage, you're going to respect right. us. Right. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> because now yeah. you're wondering why the audiences are going crazy. But with Cool in the Gang, we never actually okay. had to pass that test of fire. They were they were gentlemen from the beginning. Their their team was right. superb. Their management was was great. And we worked as a cohesive unit throughout because I think you know we all understood that this the success um, was of the was, tour of the tour depended, depended on. on all of that. And yes. so we even had the same road crew, I believe. I mean, um, lighting crew and sound That's crew. Right. It was such a huge tour that no, no, everybody no. was the same throughout most of the tour. So it was it was amazing. It was amazing. It seems like a, a a great matchup because there weren't that many groups from. The late 70s that had success, uh, R&B bands, and then continued it so well into the 80s. Cool and the Gang was a great example of that. And you guys made that transition also very nicely at that turn of the decade because it was tough for a lot of R&B bands coming out of yeah. disco and the early 80s. Yes, yes. And they had such a long history prior to us joining them. I mean, that was like a dream come true for me in particular when – I'd gone to so many so concerts, shows, so yeah. many yeah, of shows. Oh yeah. my goodness! Yeah. We used to be, we used to be, yeah, yeah. 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 Hollywood <laughs> swinging. And the Brooklyn theaters that she and I and to with yeah. the hair saw say, "Oh, we're going on tour with, with Cool and the Gang." Again. We were like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be great!" Yeah. So, but yeah, they were consummate gentlemen, and yeah, they treated us so well, and. Um, we like, like Bonnie would say, we went through a couple of seasons. I remember one show where poor JT lost his voice, yes, in Chicago, and we wound up um doing like an extra half hour yes, or something to cover their show because his voice was shot. 
but it was that spirit of cooperation. There was even a time their bus broke down, and we had we woke up crew. on the bus, and we their crew and here's their crew coming out of our bus. Yeah. So yeah, so we. I mean, it was just like that. You know what I mean? We all worked together for uh, the the good of that tour. Wow. And I know it's also your guys, um, your look and your you know you your uh, aesthetic changed quite a bit for that record too. You, you were totally away from the space sky type stuff and um what influenced that you know your 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 look at, at that time we, we landed it was a progression <laughs> we, we already did it for, but on earth and now we're integrating into the, 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 the population right and uh, we, we're, we're no longer aliens right right, right. And, and, to society and as exactly. you start to Get better. You really want people. We didn't want to be the costumery, gimmicky. Right. We wanted to, people to know that we were serious about who we were, are, and were as musicians and as entertainers. And so, as like Saul said, that just started to show our maturity in in the entertainment, you know, in into entertainment industry. And we were pleased with that. Progression, you know, because then you saw a lot of groups progressing that way. I think the whole thing was a, a journey and transformation for Sky, you know, from being so rooted in brass construction, having more of your own sound, from the outfits having your own, you know, aesthetic that way, uh, all of it, and just, you know, coalesced to, to hit such a peak with that album and, and Call Me and all the success. So that must have been a, a thrill to be on that ride. Yes, right. absolutely. Best. I mean, come on. We didn't surpass it since then. That, right. that was the pinnacle. Exactly. That was the pinnacle of our success. That's right, Evan. So, and after that came uh, Sky Jammer, and um, uh, Moving Violation was a nice uh, cut. And um, <laughs> what I noticed with that record is, in general, it seemed like um, you're moving a little more toward sort of the. Uh, mainstream if you will r&b kind of thing of that particular time uh, what can you tell me about the making of that record and the direction that sky was going at that time well <laughs> that uh moving violation i wrote it <laughs> <laughs> you can tell and, me about it and uh at the time we, we were you know um we were trying to get you know a a, a certain r&b pop, uh, right. rock kind of feel, because you know these were all the influences that we were going through at the time. And we wanted to see if we could put that together to, 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 to bring something that the people would, would, would like. And so that's how uh, Moving Violation came about. And again, you know, it's a, it, the concept, it's, it's, a, it's it's a feel. It's it's a little like I said, a little feel of rock, a little feel of R and B, uh, and and our audience was was sort of growing at the time where they were interested in other other you know things than than uh, other feels and uh, sounds than what we were doing before. So we were testing to see you know how you know, how they would like that, and uh, we put it out. Some liked it, some didn't. <laughs> it had its place. <laughs> um, so you had the ballad, The Song Is For You on there. This That was a little different thing too, I noticed in that the previous records, you didn't slow it down as quickly in the run uh, sequence. So here by the third song, you're already trying a ballad. Um, how did you ladies feel about that record and that whole process and where where your heads were at at, at the time. We all had to figure out what you was talking about. No. <laughs> I got it. You got to pull that up. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I mean, not to get off topic, but we were sitting here when we first arrived last night, and uh, Saul was kind of going through the ballads um, that that he's written right. uh, and that we've done and sort of reclassifying those in our heads because we didn't do a whole lot of ballads per se right. in our performances, right. you know what I mean? So so that's one of those more kind of obscure uh, songs. 
Um, oh, and our, I say that again. Was was this song as we was that a duet? No, that wasn't. I want to say it, it is. It was. I, I can't remember. Can't. I can't remember for I know, sure. Right? Well, yeah. what's your question about it? We're we're trying to remember if it was a, a duet. duet. I believe Solomon and Dolores sang that song together. Well, Solomon wrote it. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, you must have thought highly of it if you put it as the third track, though. Yeah, well, and his ballads, I mean, Saul, we well, yeah. said Saul. Saul is a, a ballad writer. Long ballad, yeah. Now, yeah. The, the thing is that we were on uh, Sal Soul Records at the time, which was a dance label. They were never really noted for, 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 for breaking any ballads. So we were pushing the sort of the envelope and pushing them right. uh, to, 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 to try to, to to move more of the ballads in, in uh, on our, our, our yeah, albums and, right. then, and then as we went along. And then finally, um, um, we got them to, to really put something behind When You Touch, Touch me. me. And that was the first ballad that was not just known in certain areas, but was broadly known and, and was broadly popular. But we had put ballads, you know, I guess starting yeah, starting from the from third. Yes, we had ballads. We always had ballads. Yeah. Yeah. So they weren't encouraging us to do ballads. Right. <laughs> but we were doing them anyway. <laughs> and we were trying to transition right. to, <laughs> to, to, yeah. to, to feeling it. Right. You mentioned Sal Soul. Um, so I know another group that was on that label at the time, right around that time, was Aura. And I recently uh, inf uh, interviewed Kurt Jones. Uh, actually, uh, that show's going to be on soon. So, did you guys ever uh, do any tours with them, or didn't cross? We didn't. We did. what, 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 one or two. Or two. two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. signed with, with Steve Barrington and and, and them. Uh, they, they were Steve Washington. Mm -hmm. Steve right. Washington. Steve Washington. Right. right. Was around. Right. So yeah, whenever we, Connie, we, I don't remember Connie a, being yeah. Connie Johnson being with us. Who yeah, was yeah, the South Soul rep? Right. Right. Yeah. We did a couple of shows. We didn't do a lot. We didn't do a lot of South Soul partnering with with artists. We did. Some trouble. I mean, not uh, instant, instant funk. Funk. Instant we did some yeah. shows with instant funk and and like you said, aura. But we were, but again, we were not the typical salsa dance artist. Right. Although right. we were on this typical yeah, dance right. label, so we were. And uh, instant funk was the only was the other funk group that they mm -hmm. had. So it was right. us and instant funk. Uh, and everybody else was, you know. And then it, they had First was, Choice, was, they had Joe Batan, was, but all of them was, were in a whole other exposure. Right, they were more in the disco side. Disco club, yeah. Because right. they were before, they were a little right. bit beforehand. Way before us, yeah. yeah.